Hey, praise the Lord. It's Pastor Stuart Welch, Senior Pastor over at Bread of Life Elk Grove. I just want to welcome you to our video series, This Month's Message, Faith Food. That's what we're concentrating on. We just came out of a tremendous eight-week series on God Transforms. And now that God has done this supernatural work on the inside of us and He's prepared us, now we want to just feast at His table. Now we want to take the time to eat the food of faith that it's going to cause for our spiritual man to just flourish. We'll take so much time and we'll input so much energy and we will invest, you know, in gyms and blogs and meal planners and so many other things to take care of this natural body of ours. But how much are we doing to take care of this spiritual man? I mean, our spiritual man in many of our lives is impoverished. It's, it's, you know, left under uh, much neglect when we're going to the gym and we're exercising, we're walking, we're running, we're biking. We're doing all these things. We're eating right. We're preparing our meals for the week. We do so much to take care of this natural man while we neglect the things of our spirit. So God has blessed us with a tremendous series that we're moving into called uh, Faith Food. You actually are what you eat and the foundational scriptures for that are Hebrews 11 and 1 and Hebrews 11 and 6 so challenging times call for radical faith and it's not about reason it's not about logic it's about our trust and our commitment to believe God and to follow God no matter what the situation may look like no matter what it would feel like uh, the scripture says in Romans 11 and 28 that God works all things together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Now, understand, it doesn't say all things are good. And it doesn't say all things feel good. It says these things work together for good. So God bless you. I, I pray that you would stay tuned and you would listen to you know this video in, in all of its entirety and that you wouldn't turn it off because I know it's going to help you and I know it's going to bless you and I know it's going to help you to grow in your commitment to follow God no matter what it looks like because hard times come our way, difficulties come our way, extreme circumstances, they come our way just because you're a believer, just because you said yes to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life doesn't mean that everything's going to be silly posturepedic. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. No, you're, you're going to experience some valley lows. But praise be to God, you're going to experience some mountain highs as well. So let's dig into this message. Get your Bible and follow along with me. Take a few notes uh, so you can begin to reflect back upon some of the things that I say. You can meditate upon them. You can ponder them and you can pray over them and ask God for divine insight. Ask God for the revelation, for supernatural wisdom so that you would understand what he's pouring into your spirit. Uh, I'm simply the vessel. I'm simply the instrument. And I pray even now on this video that God would use me to just pour into your very life. So God bless you. Follow along with me. Go to Hebrews 11 and 1. And the Bible says there, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. And Hebrews 11 and 6 follows that. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Now take a moment, underline that word impossible in that verse of Scripture. But without faith... It's impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Challenging times call for a radical faith. The Bible has an account where these 10 lepers came through the crowd because Jesus was passing through. Now they lived in a leper's colony and they really weren't allowed, according to the law, to mingle with people who did not have leprosy. Leprosy was highly contagious. Uh, people were dying from leprosy. So they, you know, basically excommunicated these people. They put them in a colony and they all had to live there and be there and, you know, just look at each other and die. So when they did come out side of the boundaries of that colony, they would have to scream out, hey, unclean, unclean. So people could get out of the way and, you know, they wouldn't be contagious with people. But we see this account in the Bible where 
these ten lepers come to Jesus and they're not yelling unclean. They, they have gotten to a point where, you know what, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired of our situation, of our circumstance. And that's what I'm talking about. Challenging times call for a radical faith. See, if you want to see a difference in your life, if you want to see a change in your life, you have to do something different. I mean, we all know the definition of insanity. We do the same thing over and over, but yet we have an expectation for a different result. Well, things aren't going to change until you change them. Things aren't going to change until you start operating under the principles and the concepts that God has blessed us with in His written word, the Bible. Things aren't going to change for our life until we begin to step out like Peter stepped out of the boat. He said, Jesus, if it's you, bid me to come. Now, Jesus didn't sit there and explain to him reasonably why he should step out of the boat. He didn't give him the logic or the mathematical calculations that the water was going to hold him and all the things he was going to be able to do if he stepped out of the boat. Jesus used one word, and it's the same word that he uses with us today, my friend. He says, come. Peter exercises a radical faith. And he leaps out of that boat and he begins to walk on water. My friend, if you will exercise your faith, your trust, your confidence in God, I'm telling you, you'll start walking on water. You'll walk above your situations. You'll walk above your circumstances. You'll walk above your finances. You'll walk above family commotion, confrontation, and conflict. You'll walk above everything that confronts you in your life because the Bible says we look unto the hills from which cometh our help, knowing that our help comes from God. It comes from the Lord. And you know what? Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, and we look to him. Not to man. We don't look to natural situations. God's able to override all of that. So let's get into our study right now. Challenging times call for a radical faith. You begin to understand that faith is made up of three different aspects. The first one is knowledge. The second one is assent, A-S-S-E-N-T. And the third is affiance, A-F-F-I-A-N-C-E. So write those down. Make a note. I want you to be able to reflect back on these things. I want you to be able to read them. I want you to be able to begin to teach yourself. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So, you know, after you've listened to this video, after you've taken your notes, after you've written down in your Bible a few of the points that I'm going to make through this lesson, go back and recite those things to yourself. Faith comes by hearing, my friend, and hearing by the word of God. So in today's lesson of faith food, we're dealing with the first aspect of faith known as knowledge because see we have to begin where <laughs> at the beginning the first thing in faith is knowledge because a man cannot believe what he does not know now write this scripture down first peter 3 and 15 because this is our note the first thing in faith is knowledge a man cannot believe what he does not know first peter 3 and 15 but sanctify the lord god in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. See, we have to know what we know is what we know. And God does that two ways. He does that through His written Word. And then He does it through what we call revelation. That means He reveals. He opens up our eyes. He removes the blinders from our eyes, the plugs from our ears. He moves upon our hearts and He places His Spirit on the inside of us because Spirit connects with Spirit. The Bible even says, Who shall know the Spirit of God except the Spirit that is in Him? Amen. So, you know, we begin to understand that God will open up His Word. You can read through it all you want and it's just a book. It's just a literary instrument. But man, when God begins to reveal things to you, now you begin to know and understand. And when you've had an experience with the living God, when you've had an encounter with God, when you've you know, had interaction with the Lord in such an intimate way, you begin to know what you know. And now you know that it's true. So it says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready. See, any instance, any time. People are going to come to us. Why do you believe what you believe? And they're really looking for an answer. They're really looking for a reason to follow after God. They're really looking for a reason to come after God. And, you know, you have the ability through the understanding and revelation and illumination of God's word to be able to express to them 
because God is waiting to have the same experience with them. Now, it may not be the similar circumstances that surround your type of conversion, but we never know what God is going to do in the lives of his people. That's the fascinating thing about how God operates in the world. I mean, my story is not like anybody else's story. We're as individual to God as our fingerprint is. And then Romans 10, 14, write that down. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him whom they've not believed? How, how can you trust in a God that you haven't believed? And then it says, how shall they believe in him who they've not heard? If, if nobody knows uh, about God and, and uses you know, what God has given us or taught us, then how can they believe? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And that doesn't mean the pulpit on a Sunday morning. God has given each of us, you, me, my wife, whoever's in your life, our inner circle. He's given all of us a ministry. And it's not a pulpit ministry, my friend. The Bible says that God has called all of us unto the ministry of reconciliation. See, so we're all ambassadors on this planet. And we're supposed to utilize the gifts and the talents and the abilities that God has given us to draw men to God. That's what God has called us for. He doesn't have bench sitters in, in the kingdom of God. He doesn't have people just come in, sit on the back row and, oh, I enjoyed that service. Oh, they sing so nice. Oh, the preaching was very nice. No, that's not what God has called us to. God has called us to engage. God has called us to be active. God has called us to the front line. He's called us to the battle. Uh, we're, we're following after our commander. You know, we, we gave, uh, uh, Oscar awards and nominations to the movie called Braveheart. You know, Mel Gibson did a movie called Braveheart. And we just thought, you know, that was one of the greatest movies in the history of movies. But what was it about? When he flung the heart of that king before the enemy, even though the enemy was overwhelming, he riled up those troops and he said, you know what? Fight for the heart of your king. And he flung that heart into the midst of the enemy as they were charging. And them men laid down their life so that they could battle for the heart of their king. And that's what God has called you and I to. He's called us to fight the good fight of faith. He's called us to step out of our comfort zone. Remember, you can't be both outstanding and comfortable at the same time. Not in what God has called us to. God has given us a mission. He's given us a direction. The Bible calls it the Great Commission. Go ye therefore into all the earth and preach the gospel. That's what God has called you to. That's what he's called me to. My ministry is different from your ministry. You utilize the gifts and the talents that you have to bring about God's glory. Because remember, Hebrews 11 and 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And what's our number one plan for even being on this planet? that we would be pleasing to God. Hallelujah. So note those two scriptures. Go over them. Read them. Now look, it's necessary to true faith that a man should know something about the Bible. That's what we live by. Some people have even entitled it B-I-B-L-E, basic instruction before leaving earth. Uh, so that's our manual. That's our guidebook. You know, I was very blessed to, you know, serve the state of California as a police officer for numerous years. But when I joined that department, man, they gave me five, six, seven different manuals on the requirements and things that I had to fulfill in being a police officer in this wonderful state of California. But you know what? I had to learn those manuals. I had to learn how to operate in my office or my calling as a police officer and beloved you have to learn how to operate in the kingdom of God you have to learn how to operate what is it that God loves what is it that God hates what is it that God desires out of our very life and our existence how does God desire us to go in and out amongst people how does God uh, desire us to treat men and women how does God desire us to you know deal with confrontation and conflict in the midst of our life because we do it all by faith we do it all by trusting him. We do it all by believing in him. Now, look, you know, we we find it simple to exercise faith in so many other ways, because, hey, on Sunday morning, the people come in the building. Nobody I've never in all my years of being in church have ever seen anyone pick up a chair, look at the manufacturer's tag on the bottom of it, check the rivets along the side, 
check the pews for, you know, make sure the dowels were in there or the screws. I've never seen that. I see people come in and just plop down on that seat and they have faith and trust and confidence that that seat's going to going to hold them up. Now, here's another example. You ever used a coupon in your life? I don't know if you have. I mean, I have. Uh, I've coupon shopped, you know, for years. But it's very interesting to me when you hand that coupon to the clerk other than an expiration date. They don't question the value of that coupon. Now, it's interesting in the small print, it'll say this coupon is worth one one hundredth percent of a penny. <laughs> but but yet you can get two ice creams for five dollars, right? <laughs> the, the coupon isn't what holds value. It's the authority of the people who've printed the coupon. They've stamped the value on that. And that's how God treats us because we hold no value except to the value that we hold to God. And then when we allow God to direct us and utilize us, man, we become the most valuable person on the planet. When you are operating in the gift and the ability and the calling in which God has placed on you, that's where your value comes from. It doesn't come from what people say about you. It doesn't come from, you know, the awards on your walls. It doesn't come from the magazine articles that have been written about you. It doesn't come from the medals that hang, you know, around your neck. What it comes from is God. The Bible says, you know, let a man not praise himself, but let his adoration and his praise come from above. So, beloved, let your praise come from God, not from man. So you got to know something about the Bible. Believe me, this is an age when the Bible is not so much thought of as it used to be. There's an account in the eighth chapter of the book of Acts. Now write this down, Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, because I'm not going to be able to read all that scripture to you, but I want you to be able to have it in your notes and I want you to be able to read through it. But it deals with a man named Philip. And he sees what's known as an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, verse 35 specifically, it says, because uh, here the eunuch is reading this passage of Isaiah in, in the Bible that he has. Of course, it wasn't a Bible then. It was scrolls. And he's reading this, but he doesn't understand it. And Philip comes alongside of him and he says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I? I have no man to teach me. See, beloved, so... Verse 35, it says, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at that very scripture, he preached Jesus to him. So see, we all need someone in the midst of our life to begin to inform us about the things of God. That may be a family member for you. It may be a friend that you, you know, heard they go to church or you know, they have this relationship with God or they've talked to you before about trying to be intimate with God. But, you know, you've held your hand out or, you know, you, you put them down or you may be the one that people have come to you and, you know, they've asked you questions and, you know, they, you know, but you, ah, well, I don't want to get into it. I don't want to offend anybody. We all need a fill up and we've all been a eunuch. So reach out by faith, understanding that how can they believe what they don't know and how can they know what they don't hear? So God bless you, man. I'm, I'm so excited 